Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Ladies Study Group in Kolkata, I'm so delighted to welcome you all today. Let's together get ready to enjoy something fun, something funny, something candid, and most importantly, something that's going to be very, very special. My guests today are truly spectacular. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have with us Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who is a third time member of the Indian Parliament, and with him is his interlocutor, Mr. Anubhav Pal, who has been described by the New York Times as India's most intelligent comedian. And for those of you who think I've made a mistake with my English or my pronunciation, an interlocutor is a conversation partner. And there very much a part. <laughs> and very much a part of the vocabulary that is going to be used by our speakers today. And so on your screens, I present Dr. Shashi Tharoor and Mr. Anubhav Pal. Welcome to Ladies Study Group, gentlemen. And thank you so thank much you. for Good putting to be us. You. Thank you, dear. Thank you so much. Thank I, you, Anubhav. Many for the so before I hand over the screen, I would like to add that both one. our dashing gentlemen have strong Kolkata roots. Dr. Tharoor went to St. Xavier's College in Kolkata, and Anubhav Pal has done his schooling from my alma mater, Lamatnia. Dr. Shashi Tharoor is also the best-selling author of 21 books and is known for his excellent language and diction. His most recent book, titled Tharoorosaurus, has just been published by Penguin Random House India and is dedicated to this passion. The book name itself is a very interesting wordplay of his name, and it has 53 unusual words from every letter of the alphabet. So let's get ready to be impressed and say goodbye to our hippopotamonstrosis scopodaliophobia. That was a tongue twister, Dr. Tharoor. I practiced it so many times, and I hope I got it right. <laughs> so hip, that word means the fear of long words, by the way. That's right. So, Anu, you got it right. Yeah. <laughs> and Anupam Pal is Kolkata's very own homeboy, as he was born here too. And apart from being one of India's funniest people, he's also a prolific screenwriter and the author of four hit stage plays and a weekly columnist for leading dailies. Amazon Prime TV's latest offering, Vakalat from Home, is a 10 episode series shot entirely during the lockdown and has been scripted and written by him, and is a laugh riot full of utter commotion and chaos. So gentlemen, the screen is yours. Dr. Tharoor, uh, you were about to say something about Lady Study Group. Will you carry on? <laughs> no, no, I've just done a lot. I've done a lot of events with the Lady Study Group of Calcutta, true, true. going back more than three decades. But this is the first one that's virtual. The first one during a power cut. So I'm afraid I'm on <laughs> yes. my with you. And the first one involving a comedian. So in all these, I think we are, we are, we are probably uh, doing much better than we might otherwise have done. Well, I don't know, sir. I mean, you did some stand up for Amazon Prime. So I think uh, we're, we're both might be in this profession. Um, so I'm going to... the first one involving two comedians in that case. Two comedians. <laughs> but we'll keep it. We'll keep it to the book. We'll keep it to the book and we'll tell our viewers that in case there is a technical glitch on either one of our sides, it's because you are on a phone battery uh, in the middle of a power cut. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I, I, you know, people don't believe me when I tell them this, but I have a power cut every single day in the notorious Lutians Delhi, this oasis of privilege in India. The truth is that, uh, that I, there is not a single day in my 11 years here that I haven't had a power cut either for a few seconds or for a few hours. This one seems to be heading towards one of the longer ones. It's been going on for half an hour already. Sir, the nation wants to know if Dr. Tharoor has power cuts, what hope is there for the rest of us? There you are, I must say. I mean, I'm sure Narendra Modi doesn't have a power cut, so that's how it works. Yeah, that is how it works. He's, and he's down the road from you. Now, to the book, sir. To the book. I My first question has to do with the title. And my question for you is this. Is it Tharoor plus Thesaurus or Tharoor plus Brontosaurus? 
because they put a photo of a dinosaur and a thesaurus. It's confusing. Right. Well, I think it was meant to combine are the words tyrann tyrannosaurus because so many are terrified of different of difficult words and thesaurus since people want to be able to look up these difficult words with my name so that's how it came up but if you ask me what am i i suppose i i i'm 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 a you know just as with sheep there's always a black sheep and in a white herd so i am yep. the tyrannosaurus who's not a tyrant but a democrat no one should be terrified of me and my words I, i'm sort of the black sheep amongst the tyrannosauruses um and if you think i'm a brontosaurus and maybe more accurately i'd be a brontesaurus because of the the literary allusions of the bronte sisters since this book is full of various kinds of literary allusions as well it's very clever very clever you put it the bronte <laughs> too, and as a t-rex maybe you are a devourer of words rather than humans yes exactly but while i devour the words i also am very happy to regurgitate them for the benefit of the of the uh, of the public <laughs> So this next question is not from me. Uh it is from Rahul Dakunia, the creator of the Amul advertisements. Yeah, uh, I will so read I, it. I've come across him, yeah. I will read it verbatim sir. He writes mm -hmm. and I quote Doc dear Dr Tharoor, we put up a hoarding that said Tharoorosaurus anyone? I think your publisher got the idea from the title from the Amul ad. We naturally love you and have a long association with your family. I would like to know Now that penguin have stolen the title what do i get in return instead of royalties <laughs> well two crucial letters missing in your ad rahul you said tharurorus uh whereas they said tharurosaurus and that that's what makes a difference but you know i can say to rahul i've been an unpaid brand ambassador for amul chocolates for a long time i think i've tweeted pictures of my mother and me surrounded by amul chocolates of various kinds so i i would argue we are even but since rahul is probably the guy who came up with the marvelous word amulicious uh for amuliciously uh utterly utterly amul amulicious let me suggest as part of my royalty payment another english word that applies to his question hamulus hamulus has amul in it and it means bearing a small hook at the end and you can see the small hook at the end of his question so mm. uh, you, so that was a hamulus question on his part because there's a little hook at the end asking for royalties i i i think he's a hamulus person sir there's a hook at the end <laughs> yes. is he captain hook <laughs> but that fed up i uh, you had said in previous interviews that your family's association with the amul brand goes a long way back i mean they put up hoardings several hoardings thururus is one of them but you have a longer association with the brand yeah, actually my family does uh, my sisters were both uh, very uh, have a storied history with amul my sister shobha was the first ever amul baby uh, in fact they went through 712 candidates and they picked her so she was and they advertised that uh, in the trade journals and then my sister smita 2 years later was the first ever amul color baby and uh, these were in the 60s and 70s posters all over the country and so on <coughs> and in some dusty musty mofusul shops my sister's color portrait as a happy well fed amul baby still there now of course i suppose i could volunteer to be a, 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 a not a not an amul milk food baby but an amul chocolate baby that would be my <laughs> only claim to fame with amul but yes the, the family does have this association and it was quite amusing for my younger sister who's now of shall we say of advanced years like me uh to find us of going to a shop in some kerala village out of the way to buy something and looking at the baby picture on the wall staring back at her of her own face so yeah. uh, it, it's it's there, there is that that wonderful association still there and she can ask for royalties in return now for being the i think she i'll connect her to rahul to pay him back for that question that has so, this question amulus <laughs> you've dedicated the book to your father um and you write quite lovingly about word games that the tharur family would play on long car rides that's right you my, my father absolutely uh was a word nut he was a uh, a devotee a fanatic i would say of scrabble he took to other word games when they were invented boggle and so on but he in particular came up with some of his own games for the family so one common thing was he would write down a nine or 10 letter word and my sisters or i would have to derive uh in my case four or five letter words from it my sisters being younger 
they were allowed even some three-letter words, and the, whoever got the largest number of words from that bigger word would win. Another game he came up with was sitting in a car on a long journey, which said, hey, listen, um, I will imagine a word. Your job, it will be a five-letter word. Your job is to guess that. You just come up with five-letter words that you guess, and I will tell you how many letters of your word are in my word. And from that, within 20 turns, you have to guess it. So that was the formula. And of course, it was a lot of fun. It challenges you. Uh, but I mean, you know, why didn't you think of a word and I'll try and guess it? Five letter words. Shall we, no yeah, should we play it? Let's play it. Yeah. So okay. I'm I'm thinking of a five letter word for you. Yeah, it has to I'll be five letters. That's a game. I'll give you a clue. I'll give you one more clue. The word is often used to describe you. Oh, that makes it uh, relatively easy. How about smart? <laughs> You got three, right? Oh, three letters. All right. Um, okay, now you see the technique of the expert player. How about start? Two. Okay, so that dem two. demonstrates that T is not there, but M is there. So Very got, good. How about steam? Steam. Two. two <laughs> now I'm confused. Two more. Two. two uh, so that means three altogether. Two, two yes. No. Two two altogether or three altogether? That's very important. If it's two altogether, they have to be, must be A and M. A is in there. Three altogether. How about harms? Very close. Very close. But you are not described as anyone who harms anyone. But very close. You. Well, you, you haven't listened to a certain news anchor lately, but sure. Okay. So not harms. Come to um, how many letters in harms? Almost all except one. Oh, thank you, Anubhav. That must be charm in that case. This is very, ah. you're very good at this. You're very good at this, Dr. Daru. Well you're trained, Baba, blessed father. Absolutely. So charm that's, is that's, the word. Charm is the word. Thank you very much. And that's very kind of you and flattering. I'm touched. But you guys Most... should play this in your family. Challenge your wife. I will lose. lose. I'll let I'm you into lose. a secret. The toughest word my dad tried on me and defeated me with was he came up with a five letter word in his mind which didn't have a vowel mits m-y-t-h-s and when you can't you know you try and get it by actually guessing which the vowels are and you find no vowels you're in deep trouble <laughs> it's impossible it's impossible few people will well, kill themselves uh, I, I failed but i'm sure a really smart pro would be able to pull it off but but yeah charm was very good sir four tries you got it now five because that was the fifth try. Well, thank five. you. Mm. Five. five, correct. Now, because this is the lady study group, there is one section on apostrophe that I think we need to talk about for one second because it's very funny. <laughs> I can see this coming. All right. Okay. Go ahead. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, uh, Dia, can I be very rude and ask you to put up a little slide with the apostrophe quotes from the book? So there now, sir. So now you've used apostrophes very carefully. The sentence right. is, those things over there are my husband's. So will you tell the audience what the difference is between these three sentences? Okay, so this came from Kingsley Amis, the famous British writer, um, who was asked about the importance of the apostrophe. And this is the example he used. He said, just take the sentence, those things over there are my husband's. And if you put the apostrophe before the S in husband's, it means those things there belong to my husband. If you put Correct. the S after the, and if you put the apostrophe after the S, those things over there are my husbands. That means they belong to several husbands of mine. And then if you say those things over there are my husbands without any apostrophe, that means I married to all those men over there. They're just things. You know, those things over there are my husbands. <laughs> That's the Correct. idea. But which Correct. sort of, you know, frankly, it, it sort of illustrates how important punctuation is. I remember in my school days. A wonderful punctuation lesson um, in which allegedly, I'm sure this is an apocryphal story, a co-educational class was asked to punctuate the sentence, woman without her man is useless. And all the boys punctuated it, woman, comma, without her man, comma, is useless, full stop. And all the girls punctuated it, woman, exclamation mark, without her, comma, man is useless. <laughs> so you see how important punctuation is particularly at the ladies' study group. So in 2020, that first one, where 
where we men come out on top that's not even a sentence anymore that is disqualified okay. delete delete control all delete <laughs> as i said it so, goes back to my school days so you can put it back to old fashioned thinking i'm going to actually ask you about those days um now but i want to ask you about those days using your words so dr okay. tharoor your book contains delicious descriptions but of bunch of words but my favorite are and i'm not going to pronounce it correctly epistemophilia and cromulent mm. would you tell us what those words mean and how you used it but well, epistemophilia is the excessive love of knowledge you know it's 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 a and too much of striving for or preoccupation with knowledge for its own sake so like you know somebody who's nose deep in general knowledge textbooks um, makes him positively antisocial and people say you, you you're guilty of epistemophilia and we all know kids like that in india you know mugging up useless trivia to ace quizzes enter gk competitions maybe one day to score those extra marks in the national competitive examination i don't know but the fact is that the acquisition of knowledge as a national preoccupation in india as an end in itself in india this is really not about actually acquiring mastery of a difficult subject or deepening your understanding of the world and its mysteries it's merely a test of memory Correct. right involving remembering an obscure fact for its own sake and Magina. there's supposed to be in, in the theory of knowledge there are two kinds of knowledge there's what's called lexical knowledge of what you know of places of of things of uh, of 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 dates all of that that's lexical knowledge and there's procedural knowledge which is how how do you do something how do you approach a problem how do you solve it etc the problem with epistemophilia is it focuses only on lexical knowledge and mm. that's that's why an excessive love of knowledge is not considered a good thing the other one is cromulent cromulent is actually a very recently made up word it really goes back to 1996 and i think one of the reasons you like it is it made up by comedians it was made up for the american animated tv show the simpsons mm -hmm. and cromulent means appearing legitimate but actually being spurious it first appeared as i said on this tv show from there it made its way into some sort of popular usage some us supreme court brief the merriam webster dictionary picked it up and initially the word cromulent meant fine or acceptable and apparently a character in the simpsons uses the wrong term Uh, instead of saying enlarges he says embiggens <laughs> but a teacher says oh that's a perfectly cromulent word and that usage led to the ironic meaning the word now has because cromulent was itself a fake word invented in 1996 to defend the credibility of another invented word so something is cromulent when it sounds plausible but it's actually not true or accurate and and the thing with that is that uh, you know i i applied all the time to half the claims of the government I know this is not a terribly political gathering but in my book too there are a few political examples and cromulent lends itself very much to one of the government is constantly saying things that seem to be on the surface legitimate but are actually quite spurious you know like um its testimony to the supreme court on rafal or on the migrant workers or whatever um which the court takes at face value and turns out later to be not true and that's something which which i think cromulent is a word almost invented for that kind of behavior and i will ask you in a bit sir about your own words to describe this government but now ever i have a education related question um okay. you went to st steve you went to st stephen's new delhi st xavier's calcutta fletcher school of diplomacy which is run by harvard university and tufts university uh, you are perhaps the most educated person ever to have wifi now my question is <laughs> specifically about st xavier's calcutta because our main audience is is in calcutta and mm. around the world but the main audience is calcutta did you find your experience it's at st xavier's calcutta epistemophilic or was it cromulent <laughs> neither frankly uh, since st xavier's is a great school really taught you to value knowledge uh, not merely to pass exams but to understand things better and i very very grateful to my teachers who gave me that sense of in fact I, it was only a place like st xavier that could prompt me to do some of the insane things i did like uh, i loved history so much that after class and beyond the requirement of the textbooks i went to libraries and researched history and wrote essays for myself not for the teacher not that the text the notebook has been found by an uncle of mine no markings by any teacher or anything like they weren't meant for school work it was just for my own pleasure and that i think that love of knowledge was imparted 
to me by 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 the by the school. So I'm very very grateful to them for that. And when you say cromulent, um, I would say that um, I would say that uh, that implies something wrong or, or spurious about the education. So it's certainly not something that could be said about St. Xavier's. By the way, since I began by saying I'm doing this in the middle of a podcast, the power is back. But if this is good enough, we can carry on like this, because otherwise I would have to cut the show, um, log in back again into, into the, um, into the uh, official Wi-Fi that I have and return. Would you pray? If, if there's any issue about the quality of the picture, I can just come back again. I will, I will turn... if the ladies would like a break. Uh, I would turn to Dia and uh, the great ladies of Lady Study Group to give us instructions. Dia writes in the private chat. Uh, she's Maybe coming. And yeah, we're fine. We're fine, I think. Should we just carry on like this then? Yeah. You're looking okay. dashed, like I said. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dia. All right. Anuva, back to you. Done, sir. Done, sir. Um, the, it was quite interesting because you asked about your Wi-Fi connection and Dia just said you're looking dashing, which wasn't the answer. <laughs> she's that obviously a 21st century lady who pays the compliments <laughs> and doesn't wait to be paid herself. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, so carrying on, sir, my next question has to do with your use of the English language. My question is, Dr. Tharoor, I grew up in a Bengali household in Calcutta and we spoke English mm. at home. Mainly because a certain kind of Bengali still thinks that the Viceroy lives in Raj Bhavan and we have to impress him. <laughs> However, you said in a recent interview with Karan Thapar that you spoke English at home when your kids were young out of necessity. Tell us about that. Well, actually, I already spoke English at home growing up because, you know, what happened was that um, my parents are, were uprooted Malayalis. They were expatriates living in, in Mumbai, then later Calcutta. Then I went off to Delhi. So... Um, they didn't see much point in instilling in us a whole lot of Malayali culture. We had a sort of adequate domestic Malayalam to ask for food and, and, and you know, follow basic instructions. But the language at home became English because that was the one language we could take with us wherever the family moved. Uh, it was a language in which we went to school, the language in which we had friends from all over the country. And because Malayalam was therefore not a dominant language, Neither my sisters nor I acquired a Malayali accent or a Malayalam accent or anything like that. Uh, English became de facto our first language, the language in which we taught, in which we quarreled, in which we played, and so on. So it was already the language at home. Now, uh, when I met my son's mother, uh, Minu, at Delhi University, um, obviously the language in which we connected was English. And later, when she became my wife, um, uh, inevitably, though I spoke I mean, she, she's half Kashmiri, half Bengali. I should have clarified that. Uh, and perfectly trilingual, I might add. Uh, the Kashmiri half is diaspora, Allahabad, therefore Hindi. And the Bengali half is very much Calcutta, therefore excellent Bangla. And, um, and, and so, uh, like every, every person with any smidgen of Bengali blood, she wanted to make her children Bengali speaking, right? I mean, the oh. chauvinism of the culture being what it is. So yeah. she said, okay, we're going to have Bengali at home, even though my Bengali is atrocious, so close enough. And that's obvious. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but anyway, so till about the age of two and a half, all my kids heard spoken to them was, by, was Bengali. But then they realized that their father and mother were speaking English to each other and that friends coming home, we, except with one exception of one Bangladeshi family we knew in Geneva, friends coming home were speaking English to us. And so inevitably the kids have this uh, you know, a rather unconscious hierarchical selection of languages, they promptly, by about two and a half, three years old, they started answering <coughs> Bengali comments in English. And after a while, their Bengali became almost non-existent and English became the language at home. So in, in some ways, I don't think that this is indefensible. Uh, of course, because my UN career had happened to take place abroad, but the same story could have been true if we were living in, say, Trivandrum or Chennai, and Mino was trying to inculcate Bengali in the household. It, it would not necessarily uh, have been able to be sustained for the same reasons. So my ad advocacy of English is very much that it's a pan-Indian language. It's mm. a language that allows a Bengali to talk to a Malayali instinctively. If it turns out they discover they have either Bengali or Hindi or something else in common, they can always switch to that when they want to. But the truth is that it becomes a lingua franca in the good literal sense of the term, a language that is spoken freely everywhere. Correct. Admittedly by a small minority, a small elite, but everywhere. 
and just for the audience who may not know uh i i read uh, your your son's writings quite regularly in the international press and they are very respected non fiction writers and journalists they are indeed and kanishk is also a respected fiction writer he's won the um, uh, the young writer award um, uh, at the bombay lit live literature festival just 3 years ago for his collection of short stories swimmer among the stars and though he is you know been forced to rely on journalism to pay the rent um his brother ishan uh, is the pure non fiction writer somebody who's uh, made a name for himself as a foreign columnist and foreign affairs columnist in the washington post where his kanish i think will still make his mark eventually as as a as a fiction writer and novelist he has a, an amazing talent in that domain well that's the thing as long as they're doing journalism that is not what journalism is in, in india now which is chasing cars i think they're fine <laughs> and chasing for bollywood starlets yeah exactly i'd have to ask you about that but before that so you did stand up comedy on amazon prime <laughs> that became a massive viral hit nationwide you know i have to ask you about this a number of my colleagues decided to retire after watching it saying they couldn't compete um did you notice anything in the vocabulary of stand up comedy that could be used by a politician not at all because you know you guys constantly use language to shock whereas politicians are supposed to use language to reassure and you know as a politician i also know that comedy has not served me well because every time i've attempted to be funny it's come back and bitten me in the ankle uh, because, <laughs> because of the the various um, the various constructions and misunderstandings and twists that my political enemies could give to any attempt at a joke i should say in any case in these days of covid who has time for comedy and i was explaining to somebody that the correct name for covid is actually n uh, the novel coronavirus she said but why is it called a novel coronavirus i said because it's a long story and then a long pause followed you know so then i said you know come on it's the longest anything is anything made in china has ever lasted and that didn't play very well either so I, my answer is that during lockdown you could try stand up comedy but because of the lockdown you'll only be allowed to tell inside jokes and then if i told you all the joke i'd have to wait 14 days to check whether you got it see now sir you are being harsh on yourself about the quality of these jokes i have a larger <laughs> point here i have a larger okay. point now some, some people will say that millennials may find some of these jokes not with it with the generation but here's my argument sir i think a significant section of india in the diaspora and we aren't a lot of people they just want to hear you speak right many of them say they want you to be prime minister they don't really care there's a constitutional democracy with a majority party <laughs> we don't even understand all the meanings of all the words you're saying we just like how you sound it's about i'll tell you the number we're about 10 million people so and we're all over the world so my question is and it's a bit of a silly question but think about it instead of running in 2024 with tiruvananthapuram which you won so many times and it must be boring why don't you form a breakaway republic just for your fans we could find some land near goa fill it with old novels and make you the prime minister <laughs> goa no no it has to be tiruvananthapuram because anything less than seven syllables would not be a challenge <laughs> exactly exactly no exactly. Exactly. but seriously i mean let's not go into setting up breakaway republics first of all repulsive tv will have will have a breaking news story saying that tharoor announces desire to secede and the next thing i know i'll be <laughs> disowned by my party and denounced uh, by by uh, every every uh, well meaning self righteous um, person watching this so no 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 breakaway republics i'm a loyal loyal indian citizen and i don't want to give fodder to repulsive tv anymore that's true that's true no they they don't get irony right so tonight's news it will be carried on tonight's news but that uh, brings me to a question about politics sir because politics and language are so closely connected and i am going to ask you to talk about prime minister modi's government in your own words and i'm giving you four choices from words in your book and my question is prime minister modi's government to you sir is it a cacistocracy a lunacy a kerfuffle or a juggernaut <laughs> well electorally they've been a juggernaut in an unstoppable relentless moving force that destroys anything in its path and we've seen that in 2014 2019 and a bunch of state elections in between 
In power, however, they've been a kakistocracy because a kakistocracy is a form of government in which the least qualified or most unprincipled individuals are in power. And we've seen that with demonetization, with the way in which they treated the migrant workers, with the three and a half hours notice uh, on which they shut down the country, all of that. So um, it, it's been pretty grim. And of course, uh, of the words you offered me, all their sound and fury also does amount to little more than a kerfuffle. So uh, <laughs> they, they, I think I, I would use three of those four to, dis to dismiss uh, this, this government. It's a good answer. Good answer, sir. Um, now, a lot of people don't you know. Watch out, you're going to get an income tax rate tomorrow, as I do. <laughs> it's done. It's done. But also, I'll be the first person to rate that as zero income. So it's, uh, you know, I think they, they will find themselves in a kerfuffle. Hey, listen, you're going to discourage a whole lot of would-be stand-up comedians if you say you have no income. This, this is true. But I think that uh, now that politicians are turning to stand-up, they have a lot of competition anyway. So this is one more. <laughs> But so I want to talk a little bit about your constituency because people, I don't think, realize uh, how big your majorities have been. I mean, I know uh, the recently deceased Ram Vilas Paswan, I think, holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest majority, five lakh votes. Yes. But you've won twice with over three a lakh votes. Three, no, three uh, twice, times. Twice but, with over twice. A lakh. but the thing is that um, um, I think why, why people give me credit for that is because it, in both cases, these are three cornered races. Uh, mm. A two or three lakh majority in a two cornered race. Let's say you're with against just one serious opponent, uh, usually Congress versus BJP in other parts of the country. In Kerala, the communists are also there. In fact, when I first won, it was a seat that the two previous elections had elected communists. So we have three serious contenders every time. Uh, communist BJP and, and myself. And in this case, yeah, that's what made the majority good. But, you know, the truth is that um, um, these majorities, sorry, you, you probably had a question attached to talking about the majorities. Um, no, uh, but I'll come to that later, but please carry on. No, so so basically, I mean, to, to my mind, it's, it's just a question of uh, uh, your feeling a sense of responsibility and accountability to people. Because, you know, when I first came into politics, I half expected they'd give me something like the Rajya Sabha, which was the logical thing for someone of my background to expect. But the Congress didn't have anything to offer in the Rajya Sabha anywhere. So they said, will you contest? And I said, why not, without having a clue how challenging it was to actually go out in the hottest months of the year, uh, speaking Malayalam morning to night, making speeches, uh, asking people for votes, um, uh, uh, participating in live debates, which are a feature uh, of Kerala uh, elections that perhaps don't, don't actually get done so much elsewhere. Uh, all of that. And then, and then coming back, knowing that it's because of what you've said, the promises you've made, and what people have seen in you, that you are now in that position. And therefore, the 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 the, uh, the question that people have is, what's he going to do for us now? And that becomes, in many ways, the most important uh, challenge for a for a politician is being accountable to the people whose votes he has sought, and seeking, therefore, uh, uh, to to perform in accordance with their expectations. The Rajya Sabha is very different because you don't have a particular constituency to relate to. Correct. And and the fact that you've come back three times means they're happy with the work you're doing for the constituency, so much so that you are campaigning on the basis of governance. My question is, sir, when you're on the road campaigning, do you ever use big English words? I mean, you are in <laughs> India's 100% literate state, or do you stick to Malayalam? No, I try not to use English words at all because, of course, you campaign in Malayalam. It's actually quite ironic because one of my distinguished predecessors as MP for Tiruvannamthapuram was the, uh, the late VK Krishna Menon, who in 1971 won the seat um, without speaking a word of Malayalam. He had long since forgotten his Malayalam because he left Kerala, you know, 60 years earlier. And he campaigned entirely in English and he won. But today, Before. anyone trying that stunt would lose his deposit. Uh, and anywhere in India, it's true. It's not only in Kerala. I think the fact is that people expect to be addressed in their own mother tongue. And so I speak Malayalam all the time. The the ironic footnote to this business about using big words in Kerala, though, is that when I came up with that lame joke about Floxinossi and Hilipilification, you know, when this whole mm. business about Farago had led to me getting a reputation for big words, I said, let me turn this to my own advantage. And so when I was releasing my book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, I actually issued the announcement in a tweet saying, my new book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, is more than just a 500-page exercise in floxy nor seen And needless to say, 
that then went viral. Millions of people started looking up the word and gave it. I mean, I, frankly, it was a word I'd come across in my high school and college days, but it suddenly got a new currency. All it means is a word for the act of estimating something or someone as worthless. So all I was saying was, look, this book isn't just saying that Mr. Modi or the prime minister is worthless. There's a lot more to it. So read it. That was the message. But um, the consequence, the unintended consequence, was a whole lot of little kids in Kerala, and particularly in Tiruvananthapuram, were obliged by their parents to mug up this word. And everywhere I went for the several months thereafter, I had little four-year-olds and five-year-olds being trotted out to say, Floxy Nosi Nihilipinification to me. And um, there's been a bit of a craze. Just earlier this week, I was interviewed by one of the big radio stations in Kerala in conversation. I mean, they put me in touch with a young girl who has even found a couple of longer words, learned them up by heart and recited them for entry into some book of world records or whatever. And, and, and this has now become a bit of a, a craze. So I, I do feel I have to plead guilty to the implicit presumption behind your question. <laughs> But listen, we have to we'll spend one second talking about this word, sir. Um, just in case our readers uh, missed it. Floxy nosi nihilipilikish. I can't even say it. It sounds like an old Bengali Nihilipilification, uncle. yeah. Sorry, would you so say that again? See, see it, it, it was put together, I think, at Eton College. Uh, frankly, initially as a bit of a joke. Taking four Latin roots, all of which meant nothing. I mean, floxy meant a wisp and nihil means zero, nothing, nothing at all. Um, uh, Pili, I think, is a hair. Um, Norsi, I think, is 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 a trifle. So they put all these things together. Uh, so a, a, a wisp, a trifle, a hair, a nothingness, and they added fication. So it means it's really considering something to be a total zero. Is floxy uh, Norsi and hilipilification. Uh, the word exists. It's been used by politicians and speeches in the British House of Commons and so on. So the word is still kicking around and and. Um, it's therefore entirely legitimate for me to um, to <laughs> to to um, describe, for example, certain shall we say unpleasant news anchors. That's where I'm going. People... That's that's <laughs> where I'm going with this, because you said, sir, that uh, the word means a total zero, Correct. just a complete worthless use of space, which is how you've described it in your book. And is it fair, given what you saw with Riya Chakravarti, sir? Is it fair to say that some some news anchors in India uh, uh, represent floxy nisi nihil. How would we how would we use this word Floxine in the context? Floxy nisi uh, is uh, what they do all the time about other people, but what we should do about them. In fact, in, in, there's a joke going around that in um, in in in, uh, in a Malayali accent, that when mm. somebody asks you to describe the profession of a certain uh, fellow who's particularly notorious for shouting and declaiming and usually lies and falsehoods, uh, as, uh, and the expected answer is news anchor. The way you pronounce it in Malayali English would be news anger. <laughs> anger <laughs> seems to be what they specialize in all the time. Actually, I have two questions connected to that, sir, and also huh. to the fact that the Farago of distortions, uh, with your relationship with the media, slightly long question, um, they will write or just about say anything about you, right? However, two yeah. incidents stand out, right? Like they write about you wherever you go, whatever you do. The first was then they, when they were relentless during the IPL controversy in 2009, I think. And the second was on your personal life. And this is what we witnessed as citizens. Journalists chased your car, invaded your home, pretended your staff manhandled them, defamed you nightly. It would break anyone. You're, you retorted with, a, with an English language sentence, a farrago of distortions. But when later we discovered that the claims were false, the channel moved on facing no consequence. So can there be no remedy for you for this sort of behavior other than words? Well, I don't know. It's a very good and serious question in what's been a lighthearted conversation so far. The truth is that, um, yes, I mean, uh, you know, what, one, one does feel deeply wronged by a lot of things that have been said, and which I believe were maliciously said because people inventing falsehoods claiming things that they have to know did not happen because there was never the slightest evidence or shred of proof or any indication. And they were easily disprovable falsehoods that they that they uttered on television. Um, but there should be a remedy. In fact, in, in the case of one particular egregiously unpleasant person, I have sued him for defamation, but our courts move at a rather stately pace. And so the defamation case has been dragging on for about four or five years now. And God knows how long it will take and whether 
anything will come because at the same time i was very reluctant to do it because i am genuinely a believer in freedom of the press i believe it in the importance of actually protecting the rights of people to express them i mean if there was a genuine genuine wrongdoing by anybody um a free press is one way of exposing it or at least obliging um uh, the authorities to investigate it properly and so on now in this case and and in the case of um uh, that you alluded to of, of the square Bollywood uh, girl, the investigations have been thorough and extensive, and and and, and all legal processes are being followed. So, um, for the journalists then to appoint themselves as uh, not just as witness, which is the job of the media, but also as judge, jury, and executioner, I think becomes very troubling. And um, I would not want, at the same time, my own bad experiences to lead me to encourage the government to meddle. Uh, in, in, in media in any shape or form, I would not be somebody who would support a law or, or a regulation that would curb the media's uh, behavior, but I would urge the media to look at, the, um, at their own conduct and to have a much more rigorous standard of enforcement than there is. Um, the, the existing watchdog bodies, whether it's the press council or the news broadcast and its authority, have been fairly lame and certainly they certainly got me no redress even though various public spirited citizens complained to them and sent me copies, so I knew there were complaints before them, uh, they didn't even come out with something to wrap uh, this, this fellow and his ilk on, on his knuckles. So I must say that I'm, um, I'm very torn. I don't want to uh, get the government into regulating the media, but I do wish the media would do a better job of regulating itself. Freedom of the press is vital, but at the same time, it's got to be, it seems to me, uh, journalism with a sense of responsibility and the responsibility to society because we want a better India coming out of out of our press freedoms, out of, out of all our freedoms. No, and I think there's a collective feeling now, sir, towards that. Um, I do want to change uh, tax because uh, something, one side of your life doesn't get discussed much now, uh, and which is the fact that you could have been India's first Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, I know people forget things very quickly. Um, and I'm going to use a word from your book to ask you a question. And that word is coach, which I think is spelled C-W-T-C-H. Is that correct, sir? Kuch. Kuch. Um, and it, it's a lovely word. It sounds lovely. And it, it seems like it means, or what you've written is, that it's a hug, but much more intimate than a hug. That's right. It's a Welsh Not word. Like it's a Welsh, oh, Welsh word, and apparently it, it connotes snuggling, cuddling, loving, protecting, safeguarding, and claiming all at once. So, quitch is given by a mother to a child, by a husband to a wife, by a lover to a lover. Um, the Welsh people say that a quitch is a hug that makes you um, feel safe, feel warm, feel comforted. It's an emotional thing. So, uh, uh, but if you're asking me about that in the context of running for Secretary General, come on. The one thing you no, don't no, have I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. What I mean okay. is, all of us around the world, I know Mr. Ban Ki Moon was running, he got a lot of support from Korea, uh, but there was a conversation across dining rooms around the world in the diaspora. It would have been such a proud moment if an Indian had become the Secretary General of the United Nations. You were Under Secretary General. Now, my question to you is obviously, the Under Secretary General has to be backed by the home government, and Koreans yeah. did everything to back the UN. I'm sure they fed everybody with excellent Korean barbecue. Now, my question is from, much and more. you needed much more. <laughs> you needed the Manmohan Singh government to back you. And I'm sure they did. But what you got from them, was it a hug, but not a kuch? <laughs> no, no, they, they, I must say Dr. Manmohan Singh is the one who came up with the idea in the first place. Uh, so I, I thank him for having backed me, having nominated me without a government nominating you, you couldn't possibly in any case have done uh, this kind of this kind of work. But it's also true, Anubhav, that um, India had very many other issues. I mean, the the uh, very complicated, sensitive and vital negotiations on the Indo-US nuclear deal were going on at that time. And I think it, it's, it was difficult to imagine that India would give the same kind of priority to getting an Indian elected secretary general as clinching that with the US. And, and while we were focused on that, the US ended up committing itself to the South Korean candidate. And as we know, I came close, but no cigar. Um, I, I, I don't worry too much about it. As far as the quitching is concerned, as I said, a quitch is a very emotional thing, right? Feeling safe, warm, comforted, all of that. And one thing you don't have in diplomacy is emotions. 
Because if you right. did actually, then people would actually take Dr. Mr. Modi's hug seriously. And, and no one does. So you have to understand that, that we should leave kuch between family members. True. I'm trying to, sir. I'm, I'm hoping he gives me a kuch. I'm waiting for my kuch from, from, from <laughs> the government. Um, sir, I'm going to reduce the level of this discourse because you are an oh, intelligent man. But I'm going to reduce it something more base. I'm going to move from linguistics to love. Um, oh. Yeah. Oscar Wilde, sir, once said of marriage, men marry because they are tired, women because they are curious. Both are disappointed. Uh, you, you are, sir, as William Shakespeare once said, a much married man. Uh, with which of your, your own words would you describe the institution of marriage? I can see where you're up to. Anwar. You're trying to get me to say lunacy, which is one of the words in my book. I will not say it. Um, in fact, if you have any of the other words in my book in your mind, um, the, the only three that might apply would be Agatha Cacological, which is made up of both good and bad, both good and evil. Panglossian, that you've got to be Panglossian, that is uh, believing that everything is always for the best and the best of all possible words, so you've got to be Panglossian to get married. Or the joke that a happy marriage is an oxymoron, like, um, like United Nations, for that matter, or American diplomacy. Or military <laughs> intelligence, or so also has to be. But no, I'm not going to say any of that. I, I'm just telling you that um, I, I've, I've seen a lot of blissful, blessed, happy marriages. I just haven't had the good fortune um, of, of being as successful um, at them as many others have. And I, I really respect uh, those who create a happy home for themselves, their loved ones, their, their children, because I think ultimately. Uh, it, it is, you know, it, it's the marriage. Marriage as an institution can be the um, the uh, sort of equivalent of that kuch, uh, something which actually gives you a safe place to be in. And um, God knows everyone needs and deserves that. So, sir, I'm down to the last set of questions, and I, I will not. This was my only personal question. Um, although we have other language personal questions, um, sir Nixon once said, looking at the portrait of John F. Kennedy. Uh, when people look at him, they see who they want to be. When people look at me, they see who they are. Nixon said this. For many, for many Indians, sir, you are that portrait of John F. Kennedy. We look at ourselves and we think, oh, this is nonsense. And then we look up to you. So many of us ask, why, Dr. Tharoor, why did someone so erudite, polished, learned, come back to India and get into the snake pit that is Indian politics and have to suffer Republic TV and call drops and Big Boss? <laughs> well, I've never watched Big Boss. Call drops and power cuts, yes, we all have to suffer. And as for repulsive TV, obviously, I don't watch it. And um, there was some way I could block it on my set-top box, I would. But, but jokes apart, it, it's very nice of you to, to say that. I, I must say that I, I came into Indian politics simply because in any democracy, the best way to make a difference in people's lives uh, is politics. And as you know, even before coming into politics and uh, throughout a life in which I never expected, because I don't come from a political family, I never expected, I never have a break of coming into politics. I actually um, have been writing about politics, thinking about politics. Um, I was proud when my book, India from Midnight to the Millennium, was cited by President Clinton, no less, when he addressed the Indian Parliament. So clearly, um, the world of political ideas, of values, of principles associated with it, an awareness of the history of politics, all this has mattered to me. And all this has been part of of who I am. So to actually get a chance to put my feet where my words are, to have a chance to do something myself in the political arena was an incredible opportunity. And that's why I accepted it. Sure, I've had moments of regret and moments of, of really grotesque suffering from all the things you mentioned and worse. Uh, but at the same time, at the end of the day, I really hope that many of the things I've been able to do, say, write, think, advocate, um, and achieve on the ground in, in my, for my constituency, that all of these things have actually contributed in some way uh, to, to making a difference. And as long as I believe that, rightly or wrongly, I will continue trying. And the day I feel that my um, role and contributions are irrelevant, I'll be happy to step aside. This is not uh, my entire life, my entire career, my entire focus in life. But public service has been the focus of my life throughout, because that's what the UN was also about. And um, and I, I'll continue with it. So I, I'm not saying that politics 
is in my lifeblood. It's not. It's certainly not the lifetime career it is for most Indian politicians. But I will say, Anubhav, that uh, I don't regret having tried to do it well and make a difference for people's lives. No, I absolutely, sir. And I think, and one of the things that we really look up to is that you bring public speaking and its importance. And my next question is about that. Uh, President Trump recently said about his rival Joe Biden, he will lose like a dog. Uh, now, when you quote uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan or Pandit Nehru in Parliament, or when you bring up John Stuart Mill, I see some members of Parliament getting frightened. Others look clueless. Um, we live in an age of crassness, sir, where slogans like Desh ki ko, Goli Maro Saloko, that is what is considered public speaking. Why is great public speaking needed? Why is it so essential from politicians? Yeah, at, at, it, at its best, public speaking is the art of inspiring people, of giving them hope, of giving them reassurance, of speaking to their innermost needs and demands. And I must say that uh, uh, Mr. Modi does it very well. I just wish he actually implemented everything he thought and said because his, his public speaking is really remarkable. So I, I don't want to, to knock all of the, the public rhetoric that's out there. There are some very fine speakers in our public life. Um, our problem, Anubhav, is not that we have, have or don't have good public speaking. Our problem is that we don't have good implementation uh, of the various things that are needed to serve the people of India. I agree. But, last couple but, of questions, I'm afraid, Anubhav, because we'll have to yes. wrap up. Last two, sir. Last two. Uh, okay. And, and just this is a very quick one. Um, speak, you said you talked about Prime Minister Modi's speeches. Uh, now, as a native Gujarati speaker, he's really captured the heartland with short Hindi phrases, right? Uh, and all your fans, all of us love you, and they say, it's great to be the big boss of India's most literate state, but your appeal is limited in India's heartland, like UP, Bihar, where the knowledge of PG Woodhouse is probably limited. So, like Prime Minister Modi has Abki Bar, Modi Sarkar, Mitro, Sabke Saad, Sabka Vikas, Ache Din, Atma Nirbhar, short, catchy ones. What can we come up with for Dr. Tharoor for the masses? Well, uh, when I ran for president of St. Stephen's College, which I don't normally associate with the masses, my, my campaign team came up with Shashi Tharoor, Jitega Zarur. So there you are. That's good. That's good. Uh, that's good. I've been speaking a little more Hindi of, of late, um, uh, sound bites, the occasional things on, on TV. One of the things I said in Parliament in discussing the COVID pandemic was that um, we don't say that and that perhaps could be another. No, doesn't catch it. Sorry. No, very good. No, I'm saying this is good. It's boom, boom. So we've got a few things like that going. Not doesn't have the evocative bluntness of Goli Maro Salmoko, but we'll put that aside for now. Goli Marna the Bohot Lokarte, unfortunately, on the other side of the aisle. No, Bimari and Tayari rhymed. It's very good. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you. It's. Sir, so last question, and this is uh, my last question before I hand it over to the Lady Sari group. And this is about young people, right? And this question is coming from young people. I've done a little survey. Um, now, here's the thing. Indians under 30, of which there are 500 million, they feel, because I've spoken to all of them, some of these complicated English words confuse them. They love you, sir. They love you, though, right? And I feel just like Bernie Sanders has the young millennial following, so do you. Still, I feel like if you spoke their language, they'd love you even more. So when we need them, when we rally your base for the eventual Shashi Tharoor for Prime Minister... No, no, don't go there. <laughs> no, no, when it happens, we need a young, young thing. So this is what I want to end with, sir. When I ask you a very young phrase, you have to reply to me like a young person. So I'm going to ask you, sir, what's up, bro? That's how they speak. So I'm going to ask you, this is how young Indians speak, What's up, bro? And you have to reply to me like a young, hip, Virat Kohli type young person. Okay? So here's my question to you, sir. What's up, bro? Just chilling, bro. Your fam, you get me. Bro, I'm so basic. But Anubhav, man, you're so extra. You're on fire, bro. You're just killing it. You got me shook, bro. <laughs> my, job, my job here is done. Sir, I am now going to hand you over to a many, many women. That is not a euphemism. <laughs> that is a fact. This is the ladies' study group. Over to Dia. Yes. Okay, I'm all out of time, Dia, but it's really... I know. 
Just one quick question then, just one question. Uh, we have many actually on the chat, but I'll just take one since I know you're out of time. So one of our members is asking, since you've been to Ladies Study Group and you are so familiar with us, and actually Anubhav's mother, Shubhadi, is one of our stalwarts. Can you create a word that we can use for LSG that will resonate with us? Describe us. Describe Lady Oh, Sandy. my gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that is a genuine challenge simply because creating words takes time, my dear. And as far as I'm concerned, you um, uh, in, this particular, um, in this particular business, you are, you are uh, inflicting upon me uh, a bout of lethologica. <laughs> which is when it suddenly forgets away what I'm thinking of. One thing is interesting, you know, there is a, an old-fashioned word that I resurrect in this book called muliebrity, which is actually the quality of being a sort of ideal woman. Now, this has become controversial today in the era of feminism. What does muliebrity mean? Uh, what do people understand when they talk about ideal women? But it seems to me that the intellectual, socially conscious, and, and, and wonderfully able women of the Ladies' Study group um, are probably the best examples of femininity available. So maybe I'll offer you from the book the word muliebrity. Lovely. That was absolutely lovely. And I'm not going to ask any more questions. I'm going to respect the fact that you need to go. But uh, my vice president, I'm going to ask her to join us. Uh, Somatadi, can you join us? You... Yes, I'm there. Yeah. We are grateful, Dr. Shashi Tharoor for your time, wisdom, and insight on the topic. Good to see you, Anubha. Thank you for engaging ladies' study group members in a humorous and witty interactive session. Thanks, members, guests, and the media for support. Over to the end. Thank you. Thank you all Thank very much. You. And, th and uh, before you go, I just wanted to say one thing. You know, the session has been such an amazing mood lifter, I think, for all of us. You've had us all totally mesmerized and captivated. So on behalf of Ladies Study Group, I want to say stay safe. And to all my viewers today, too, do stay safe and stay updated with the English language. Keep your copy of the Thirurasaurus handy. And if you haven't already got one, it's available through Penguin Random House and Amazon. And for your convenience, we will be sharing the required Amazon link with all our members post this session. So have a beautiful evening and see you soon on our next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. And Anivab, thanks for some great questions. Really enjoyed talking to you. Pleasure. Always Thank a pleasure. You, Thank you, Sumita. All Thank the best. You. Thank you.